name is Jamie, and I work here at Nature's Nursery as the Education Director. So Nature's Nursery, we are a wildlife rehabilitation organization. So our main goal is to take hurt, sick, and orphan wild animals, do our best to heal them up, and then get them back out into the wild. We Ideally, we don't want to keep them here. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we have to as ambassadors because they won't, they're not, they wouldn't be successful in the wild. Um, but here today, um, I do have a that might be wandering around in the, in the background, uh, that's Lenny. So he's one of the ambassadors that we did rescue. Um, he was, he's a uh, red fox that somebody had released into the wild thinking that he automatically knew how to be a fox. Unfortunately, he does not know how to be a fox. Um, and he's very comfortable around people. He was found at a local park, um, very thin. He was begging for food and asking for belly rubs, um, which is definitely not fox behavior. So he has a home here with us. Um, and hopefully, well, he's in the shade. So you might not be able to see him, but sometimes he walks on the platform behind me. Um, but we are the only wildlife organization in Northwest Ohio. And so we began, uh, in 1989, uh, Dave and Deb Cooper, uh, well actually Deb Cooper, she was working at the zoo and realized that there were tons of wildlife calls coming in about animals that were hurt in this area, um, but there wasn't anywhere to take them. Um, you need permits in order to take care of wildlife, um, and there's just so many different intricacies that go into helping and assisting wildlife. Um, that's some things that, you know, I never thought of before I started working here. It's incredible how much goes into it. Um, so they saw this need and they started um, right here in Northwest Ohio in White House. And this year um, has been kind of crazy. Um, it's been pretty exciting for us. Um, we've had more animals than we've ever taken in before. Um, and now Nature's Nursery, we started in Deb's garage. Um, there wasn't a building to work out of, and that's true for most wildlife centers um, across the United States. It started in people's backyards, in their garages, in a room of their house. Mm -hmm. um, we're lucky enough to eventually have found a building, um, small building, but it works, at least temporarily. Um, so that very first year they took in like 200 animals, thought they were super busy. The next year grew even more, it was 400 and then 600. All the way up to 2006, they were in this garage, and they were taking in 1,000 animals. And it was strictly volunteer-based up to 2,000. So every single person who helped was strictly a volunteer. Nobody was getting paid. Um, 2,000, um, uh, Laura Zitzelberger, she's one of our co-founders. She started up as soon as, um, pretty much as soon as Deb said that she had this awesome idea. Um, and she was actually the first paid staff. Um, and it's kind of grown since then. Uh, so now we have three full-time directors. I'm the education director. We have an executive director and an operations director. Um, we have three part-time staff that kind of turn full-time when it's busy. Um, and by busy, I mean we go from having about 100 animals that we're caring for to over 1,000 in almost two weeks. So it's pretty much the beginning of May. It's all hands on deck. Um, we even hire in uh, three seasonal staff who come in just to help during the summer. And then we have uh, 14 summer interns, and we have over 100 volunteers that just help and assist us um, throughout throughout um, the year for various tasks. Um, unfortunately, this year uh, we've kind of had to reduce that. So, um, like I said, uh, this is the craziest year for us. It's been incredibly busy. And then we had to reduce the amount of people that are at the center, um, which made it particularly hard. Unfortunately, a lot of our volunteers are um, people who were in the high-risk category, and they couldn't be here. Um, so that was a struggle we had to face, and we overcome it. Um, we all feel a little frazzled right now, but we're finally seeing a slow season or slow time of the season. Um, so this year, we actually hit uh, 3,700-ish animals so far. And we still have another month to go. And this warmer weather that we're having, well, it is great. Also means people are going to be active, and so are the animals. Um, and just today, we've taken in, we've seen a rise in animals that we've taken when it was colder. Um, but um, all of our volunteers, they kind of range and help us in different ways. The 
most important, well, there's a lot of important parts. You can't really say one is more important than the other because without all of these pieces, we cannot work. Um, so our volunteers, we have somebody who's sitting at the desk answering the hotline calls, which can be a very time-consuming task, so much so that we even pay staff to answer phones all the way up till 9 o'clock at night. Um, so we're at home or we're at the center personally just answering phone calls. Um, and we can go from during the slow season, I would say maybe 15 calls a day, sometimes no calls. And then during the busy season, that 15 calls goes to over about, over probably 300 a day. So it's a very busy time for us during the spring, summer, and fall. And then uh, we have day keepers. So people who are going out and cleaning up all the animal cages, inside, outside, in the nursery, everywhere. Um, just take, just cleaning. There's so much that goes into just cleaning the center. Um, we have people who foster. So spring and fall, or spring through fall, that's baby season. And so we need people who have been trained to care for the little baby birds that come in. Um, we have people who are uh, doing a nursery. So we convert one of our rooms into a nursery where we have baby bunnies, baby squirrels, opossums. Any baby animal you can think of ends up in this one room. Um, and we just have volunteers feeding these animals. Um, the reason why we have fosters are because sometimes baby animals need to go home with certain people because they need more around-the-clock care, so more like neonates, um, animals that are getting fed where our volunteers are waking up at 4 a.m. to feed these squirrels or the bunnies or something, you know, opossums. Um, and then the little baby birds. Uh, baby birds, when, they, when they're kind of hatchlings, to fledgling age, they need to be fed every 20 minutes. Um, so throughout the day, from the time they wake up to the time they go to sleep at night, um, we have around the clock care for them. So it's, it's a big task that our fosters do and we're very grateful for them. Um, and then we have people who transport. So Nature's Nursery, we're a nonprofit. We're fully funded by the support of the community. And so uh, unfortunately we can't drive to every call that we receive. Um, which can add up in mileage and staff time if we had people doing that. But luckily we have volunteers who are stationed around the county, um, not just our county, all over Northwest Ohio, um, stationed to go assist if they're available. But we really do rely more so on the people who find the animals bringing them to us. It's just a lot of work to coordinate. Um, and a lot of times it's just easier for the person who found the animal to bring it to us. But we do love our transporters. They are amazing. The situations they can find themselves in, jumping into water and trying to catch a goose that maybe has a, a wing injury, but it can run. And it runs right towards the water. So then they're chasing with big nets, trying to catch the goose before it runs into the water. Um, it can be quite an undertaking sometimes. You never know what they're going to find. Um, and then uh, maintenance just fixing cages like the one behind me, just making sure everything is safe for the animal, um, nothing can get into the cage or they can't get out until they're healed. And then just education. So the other part of our mission is education. So that's where I come in and I go out into the public and I teach people about the wildlife that we have. Um, so I do about a 250 programs a year um, and that was before, unfortunately, this year. This year has been thrown everything out of whack. Um, but yeah, 250 programs, and we reach about 16,000 people. So that's pretty awesome. That's person-to-person -person contact, you know, at programs to school children, assisted living centers, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Um, we go out into the community and do booth displays at festivals and fundraisers, and just try to get the word out there that we exist and there's something there's somebody out there who is caring for the wildlife if they get injured because you cannot take them to a veterinarian. That's against um, their permits. They're not allowed to take in wildlife. That's just a rule. Um, so that's why it's really important that we exist in this area because there's nobody else. Um, the closest area is probably an hour away from here, closer to um, oh, what is it? Castilia, Ohio. So that's probably the next closest one. Um, but then we also reach people through um, social media. That's been a big help. Facebook is probably one of our biggest platforms. 
Um, we reach thousands and thousands of people through that platform. Um, we also do YouTube and Instagram, but Facebook is kind of where we do most of our stuff. Um, it's just very convenient. It's even convenient for coordinating with our own volunteers. And so um, I'm going to transition a little bit and talk a little bit about this year. Um, I have a paper here with me because I, I'm a big fan of numbers. I think numbers really show the extent of what we do here. And um, I have to, I taped it to the, probably should have taped it the other way. So I'm going to pull this down. Oops, rip. Maybe I taped it a little too well. It's kind of windy. I didn't want it to blow away. Um, so I like the breakdown of the types of animals that we take in. So I have the number here. As of yesterday, we took in 3,774 animals. Um, it's the biggest year. Last year was our biggest year, and we took in 3,100 animals and thought we were really busy. This year blew last year out of the water. Um, we've taken in a total of 142 different types of species of animals that are native, mostly. There's a couple of weird ones in there. Um, we took in 30, we don't take in domestic animals, that's not what we do, um, but sometimes people don't know if it's a domestic animal that they're bringing in. So we did end up with about 35 uh, domestic animals that range from like uh, quail, rock pigeons, which they are technically in the wild, they're a very common wild animal now, um, but we took in about 35 of those. Um, domestic ducks, um, some of them were ruins, so they look very similar to mallard ducks. Um, chickens, a corn snake, some, some people brought us um, the Norway rats, um, goose, and a budgie. Uh, just weird animals that people find, the pets that have escaped. Um, we had a call earlier this year about a water monitor um, that they thought it was some kind of lizard that escaped from the zoo um, walking down the street. Um, so we get all sorts of weird calls. Um, but we do our best to assist not just wildlife, but if we can, um, all of our volunteers are huge wildlife, or not just wildlife, but animal in general fanatics. So sometimes they're willing to help in other situations too. Um, so kind of a breakdown on that 3,700 number we have. Um, this year we kind of can call it, every year there's a different type of animal that we get the most of, or more than usual. Um, this year, the more than usual animal were raptors. Um, so we took in 178 different types of raptors different types of raptors, different individuals. <laughs> um, but we took in four bald eagles, uh, 60 hawks, uh, 76 owls, 25 falcons, and 13 turkey vultures. Um, and one of the things to think about with raptors is the ba are the babies eat more than the adults, surprisingly. But they're growing. They need that extra energy. And so we went through a lot of rodents, which were incredibly expensive. So not only were we losing money because I couldn't do programs, we were losing money because we were having to go out and purchase more rodents than we expected of ever needing, because um, this year was just a weird, the year of the rapture, I guess. Um, we took in 402 waterfowl, uh, and that consisted, the majority of those numbers, um, it's kind of similar. We, we took in a lot of wood ducks this year, surprisingly, and they um, hit, we hit 151 wood ducks, and, well, we didn't actually hit them, but we hit the number, 151, um, and 162 mallard ducks. So that's a lot, and it's, we needed to create a whole different units. We took in so many animals this year that we actually had to use camping tents um, that we put up in the garage in order to store birds because we were running out of room. Um, but we made do. We are somehow managed to survive this year. Um, 1,093 songbirds. Um, a lot of those were American robins, so we took in 234 of those and 90, 90 morning doves. Um, morning doves are a little bit tricky because um, we actually have one specific or a couple specific volunteers who specialize only in morning doves because you can't just stick food in their mouths and they're happy. The morning doves, take, um, they eat through crop milk. And so it takes a little bit more specialized care to take care of those morning doves. Um, and then we do take in, it's a little bit controversial, we do take in house sparrows and take care of them and do release them. Um, but we took in 157 of those. 
And then um, mammals, uh, we took in 2,032 mammals. Uh, a big portion of that was eastern cottontail bunnies. So we took in 923 eastern cottontail bunnies. That's a lot of bunnies. And then we took in 441 opossum and 388 squirrels. So opossums and bunnies are a little bit harder to care for as far as they need to be tube fed. So you have to be very careful about how you feed them. You can't just stick food in their mouths like you can with most of the baby birds and they're happy. You really have to be specialized in how to get that tube into their stomach so they eat. And with bunnies, bunnies are incredibly high stressed animals. Even from the, I mean, from the time they're really little, they're very stressed. And it just comes with instinctively knowing they're a prey animal and they're being held by a predator. They don't understand that we're trying to help them. And unfortunately, because of that, they do get very, very stressed sometimes. And a little bit lower, but still higher than average, um, we took in 34 reptiles and amphibians. Um, now, that doesn't, that isn't a lot compared to what the other animals' numbers were, um, but for the amount that we normally take in, it's rather high. Um, we took in 20 turtles, 3 snakes, 3 frogs, and 8 toads. Um, toads usually got into accidents, usually in people's gardens. Um, so with weed whackers and shovels and just people not knowing that they were burrowed under the dirt. Um, but for the most, oh, and three of them were actually be our ambassadors. Um, somebody tried raising them as pets and they were hand feeding them for five years and then um, no longer wanted them. And you couldn't just release them and so somebody else was like, no, don't release them. I have a place I can take them. And we took them in and now three, well, unfortunately, one had cancer and we had to put it down. But the other two, we were able to keep healthy and alive, and they're now two ambassadors who have already gone on a couple of programs, and kids love them. So I like numbers. It's just kind of my favorite thing um, as an educator because it really shows the vastness of what we do here at the center, what it really takes in order for us to function. And this year, we didn't have all those the 100 volunteers that I mentioned earlier it was probably a quarter of that that actually were here every day helping us. We had a couple of volunteers who rose to the challenge and um, came out four times a week in order to help us because we couldn't have that many people at the center. Um, so a little bit more about Nature's Nursery. We are in a farmhouse now. So in 2006, we moved from that garage into a farmhouse. Um, and what's interesting is that it used to be an old farming prison. And so what we did was we took the warden's house and converted it into our center. Um, so that's a little cool historical thing here. But unfortunately, we've outgrew that space, and now we're looking to hopefully expand and grow in the future to the point where we hopefully aren't scrounging for space and setting up tents in the garage to hopefully house some birds. Um, hopefully we won't have animals in the bathrooms anymore. <laughs> um, sometimes we're, we're run, we ran out of so much space um, we actually had to go to the bathroom with squirrels. Um, so sometimes you just have them staring at you. Um, so you throw like a towel over all the cages so you, you can do your business and they're not looking. <laughs> but yeah, it can, it can be pretty rough here at the center. Um, it's just, you know, think of your house and then think of 3,000 animals, over 3,000, almost 4,000 animals living in that house temporarily. Um, we have 34 permanent residents, like Lenny, our ambassador. Um, so we have 34 different ambassadors who are permanent residents, have permanent spaces in the house, um, and they have to be separated even from the rehab animals. We don't want our ambassadors to get sick with something that a wild animal brings in. And so we have our bottom part of our house, which is the largest part, unfortunately, is where we have all of our ambassadors where the smaller part upstairs is really tiny. The rooms are, um, I think the biggest room is maybe 15 feet by 15 feet. That doesn't sound right. I'm not good at judging space. <laughs> um, but it's a pretty, just think of an average bedroom. Um, and I think of an old farmhouse and how those rooms were a little bit smaller than the average bedroom you might have today. And that's what we're working out of. So hopefully sometime in the near future, we will expand and have a piece of property that we can actually build for wildlife rehab, not just converting a house into it. Um, 
And then I have one more thing. It's a sign. It's kind of an old sign. Um, but it still kind of gives a rough cost of how much it takes to care for these animals. Um, I know staff time wasn't included in this or volunteer time, and I don't know how well you can actually read this board considering it's on, a, it's on my cell phone. Um, but um, I can kind of read some of the numbers here if you can't I see I love them. answering questions and just talking about what I do it's, or what the center does as a whole. It's really fun, and I'm really passionate about it. I love this place. Um, and it's just amazing what we do here. And before I worked here, I was a volunteer, and that's where my passion kind of started. Um, but here's a couple of numbers. Um, we did not include, oh, so weekly care costs include uh, food, medication, x-rays, um, pre-release caging, staff time, and other auxiliary expenses. Um, but this is many, many years ago, and we have a lot more staff and a lot more volunteers that go into this. Um, but every so average weekly cost per animal, I'm going to talk about bunnies because we usually get in bunnies and we did take in over 900 this year. So just as an example, the average weekly care cost per animal per bunny is $15 a week. The average length of care for one bunny is four weeks. So the total average cost of one bunny is $60. And a lot of this, like bunnies, I never realized how much bunnies eat. Oh my goodness, we were running. I feel bad because we, we're kind of in a rural area and we have uh, just a Kroger nearby. And I feel bad for all the people who went to Kroger this summer because there was no greens. If you were going to the store and you wanted um, to make a salad, you had to go to a different store because we bought out pretty much all the greens in White House. Um, we actually went as far as even traveling to other local townships to purchase all of their greens out of their store because we were just, every week we had to make multiple trips to these stores to get just greens. Um, we had people who were digging up plants out of their front yard to give to the bunnies. So um, the bunnies do best with like dandelion greens. Um, they really don't care for the flower, but they really like the leaves. And so, so many. Um, I would take, or I, I wouldn't take care of them, but I've watched volunteers do it. Um, but they would take two handfuls. And what we have here to care for bunnies, um, we sort them by age. And then we would probably have three to four in each cage. So they're like little rat cages. We take two handfuls of greens and we just toss them in there. By the end of the night, we would have to take another two handfuls and put it in there for four bunnies. So, and just handfuls of the stuff to keep them full, keep them happy, um, and ready to go. So imagine how many of these guys are in the wild eating all of this food. And that's only the ones that we care for. We took 900 out of the wild to care for them and get them back healthy. These are the ones who are injured, the ones who are hurt. If they... Um, we didn't want to take, a lot of people would try to come to us and bring us a whole nest of bunnies, but we had to turn away and we're like, no, we only want the one that's hurt because we would end up with a lot more than 934 if we took in everybody's nest of bunnies that they didn't want in their backyard. Um, so 934 hurt, sick, or orphaned, just baby bunnies, like how, and how many bunnies are still in the wild? And they're eating all of that. They're almost as good as goats. If you just have a herd of bunnies in your backyard, they mow down your grass in minutes. Just, it's incredible how much baby animals eat. And that's primarily what we get here are baby bunnies and other young wildlife. Um, I'll sh do another example, um, birds of prey to go. So bunnies are more on the lower end of the cost. And birds of prey are the more expensive to take care of because of all sorts of reasons, but mainly because of the food they eat. It's not easy to get rodents in the, I mean, we have to do a special rodent run twice a year where we get over a thousand um, just rodents in bags that we have to then cart all the way back to Ohio because it's up in Michigan that we get them from. Bring them all these rodents and try to find a place to store them just so we can survive until the next rodent run. And even then we have um, local breeders 
of rodents who are supplying us this year because we just ran, we ran out. Um, and we even supplement with other local meats. So sometimes if you go to the grocery store, there, weren't, there wasn't any, you know, ground beef or steak because we had to buy all that for the animals. And, um, we basically came up with all sorts of ways people can give. Um, a lot of people don't feel comfortable giving organizations just cash, and we understand that. Um, so we give them other options, like um, we have an in-kind donation um, list of things that we run through very quickly, like paper towels, canned cat food, and other things similar to that. Um, we have um, an Amazon wish list, um, so things people can go online to purchase for us, um, things that we use quite often, like critter keepers or gloves. Um, things that we might send with a volunteer transporter so they have the proper PPE to go out and collect a great blue heron or an eagle. Um, and then we have, and also on Amazon, we have Amazon Smile. Um, so we're set up through that. So if people go to Amazon Smile when they order, then um, we get a little bit of proceeds from that. Um, Kroger Rewards. And then we have a couple of accounts to set up with um, local, well not really local, but larger agencies, so like Rodent Pro. Um, that way people can directly purchase rodents for us to use. Um, obviously the rodents won't be shipped to us, but you could purchase like a gift card that will be strictly used. Um, not just to pur purchase rodents, but like say we get in um, something like a, a Cooper's Hawk or a Peregrine Falcon that really enjoy eating uh, quail or other birds. Um, rodent Pro also, they don't just sell rodents, but they sell quail as well, um, and other like turkey chicks, things that we can use to feed those specialist birds. Well, we well. are a nonprofit. We rely on the support of the community. If we didn't have that support, we wouldn't be able to function here. It, it, we rely on the community to keep our lights on, our doors open, and be able to feed and care for these, the wildlife. So they just support us in so many ways, not even through uh, donations, but just media support, sharing the things that we post, getting the word out there, and just helping us by sharing the poster, helping us teach others about wildlife and why wildlife is important. Um, so that's kind of the whole uh, that goes back to the theme. Everyone has something to give, and so this week, uh, I my the goal was to talk about what we do for the community and how the community supports us, how there's that cycle there. Um, and in the following uh, videos, I hope to express how much these animals help and give back to the environment, how they give to us, how we can give to them, things that we can do to kind of support our local wildlife and not only local wildlife, but I mean, honestly, some of these birds, uh, like hummingbirds, they're local here during the summer, but they fly clear down the you know, Mexico, very, very far. They go across the Gulf of Mexico, sometimes all the way down into South America. That's a long way for these little birds. And so it really does take more than just us here locally, but, I mean, people everywhere to kind of help these animals through stopover habitats. So area has been fragmented, and there are roads and buildings and cities that they have to navigate through. So it really is a collective effort of everyone to kind of help these birds get back from one point to the other, um, make sure that they have these stopover habitats, making sure um, people turn their lights off during migration so the birds don't get confused. Um, just all sorts of things that people do can give back to the environment, just like how these animals give back to us um, in all sorts of ways. Um, and before um, I end, I just want to go back to the one thing about the um, birds of prey and how much uh, how much it costs, the cost of caring for these, um, I don't even know how to describe this, these wonderful birds. They're so amazing. And just the things that they do and how they survive. And I mean, a red-tailed hawk, they stay here when it's, you know, negative 10 degrees in winter. How do they do that? That's crazy. I go outside and immediately just want to run back inside and put a coat on. They don't have the option to do that. But they are living it in the wild and they're successful. It's, it's amazing to me. Oh, my co-star is passed out. He's asleep. I don't know if you can see him in the corner there. Yes, we can. Can you tell us just a little bit about him? Oh, yeah, that's Lenny. He, he's the red fox that I um, had mentioned earlier um, that was running around um, 
uh, stealing people's sandwiches and asking for belly rubs. He was just very thin when he came to us. Um, but now he's living the good right life. He has his little uh, tube right here. Hi, buddy. <laughs> he's probably tired of me talking. We were playing earlier before this started. I was running around his enclosure um, circles, and he was chasing chasing me around. So I think I wore him out a little bit. <laughs> um, but so back to the cost of care of raptors. Um, so the average weekly cost um, per individual raptor is fifty dollars. Um, and the average length of care can range. If it's a nestling, they might be here a little bit longer because we have to teach them how to hunt. We have to teach them, make sure they can fly, uh, make sure they can just survive in the wild. Whereas if it's an older raptor, one that just came in that was injured um, or sick, we, we don't have to teach them those things. We just kind of go under the assumption that they know how to catch live food. We just make sure that they're flying properly and can be released. Um, not all the time. Sometimes we still do a live test to make sure that they can catch their live food. Um, but their average length of care ranges from four to ten weeks. So the ten weeks would be the higher end for the babies. So the total average cost of care of a bird of prey can range between $200 and $500 for just one bird. And that's not to mention uh, that could just be feeding that bird, not all the x-rays, the medical care, the staff time. Um, all the other miscellaneous, sometimes we have to get um, our vet to come in and take care of them um, for all sorts of reasons, you know, like minor surgeries. Sometimes when raptors come in, they need a little bit more work than other animals because they're getting hit by cars usually because they have like a tunnel vision when they go after prey. So they're not paying attention to the car that's coming. They're following the, maybe the mouse that's running across the road. Um, so sometimes their care is a little bit longer than other animals. But yeah. So I hope um, I told you a little bit about us, and in the following weeks we can learn more about the different types of ambassadors we have here and kind of what their role is in the environment, how they give to the environment, and how we can help them.